Thunderbirds for the NES by the combined efforts of Activision and Pac-In Video, circa 1990. Based on the 60s TV series of the same name, conceived by the late Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, by which Team America World Police was inspired, by the way. And no, the title has Jackson to do with one of the bosses in The Adventure of Link, period. That's right, even after over half a century, they're still go. They're still fucking go. Anyhow, if you've seen the show, or at the very least recall it, let alone any related media tied to the immortal exploits of international rescue, be they films, revamps, reboots, what have us, the premise should jog everyone's memory, and as per usual, not to dehumanize anyone, but god help me if I ever meet someone who falls outside said criteria. It revolves around the exploits of the secret organization, the aforementioned International Rescue, headed by the Tracy family for the sole purpose of saving and protecting all mankind. Former industrialist and astronaut Jeff Tracy, voiced by the late Peter Dinley, in charge of IR, alongside his five sons, Scott, Virgil, Alan, Gordon, and John, voiced by the also late Shane Rimmer, David Holliday, with the also late Jeremy Wilkin replacing Virgil in Season 2, Matt Zimmerman, the long-since-retired David Graham, and the also late Ray Barrett, respectively, working alongside their intellectual assistant, Brains, later going by Ray Hackenbacker, Mr. X, Hiram K. Hackenbacker, etc., also voiced by the long-since-retired Graham, are faced with a 60-day challenge imposed on by their arch-enemy The Hood, also voiced by the late Barrett, to turn over all of their mechanic vehicles to that cue ball discount blowfell douchebag wannabe son of a bitch, who's just threatened to destroy the Earth with meteors via energy sources from throughout our planet. Like, what kind of fucking shit is that, right? Now, as far as gameplay, who would expect anything less than another straightforward, yet, as we're about to discover, extremely tough and intense schmuck? Upon commencement, The Hood lays down his bullshit ultimatum thanks to John's visual, while Dr. Brains puts his two cents in, despite being unsure of where Hood's energy sources are throughout the entire globe. Three resources pinpointed, however, according to Brain's analysis, hence where our first three starting areas lie, the US, Indian Ocean, and Asia, where you're capable of commencing your missions in any order, by the way. The varying Thunderbird vehicles you send out have a 3-unit shield meter. Ergo, should they get hit that much, a damage report is then transmitted to Dr. Brains, in which case 3 days will be used up for the repair of any of these vehicles on his behalf. So bottom line, DON'T, don't FUCK AROUND TOO, too much, MUCH ANYWHERE! Regarding the controls, the D-pad lets any of the Tracy Brothers vehicles travel anywhere over land, under and or over sea, and the like, and as for B and A, they shift the directions of their added orbiters, or option weapons, akin to Silver Surfer that was out that same year, by the way and fire off their main armaments individually, in each of the differentiating operations spanning the three detected continents, while pursuing the appropriate energy sources and neutralizing them. There are three items you're capable of obtaining throughout. L recovers the shield of your vehicles, O summons the orbiters, aka options, E enhances your vehicle's firepower, and even various direction-shifting icons for your option weapons, horizontal, diagonal, and even 360 degrees counterclockwise on both sides of every vehicle, since they all fire vertically, up and or down, from the get-go. While there aren't any monumental boss fights, unlike every other shmup in history, no less, there are at least some extra scenes to make up for that, involving exploring underground or under the deep seas to further pursue and decimate not only the energy sources for Hood's diabolical means, but also the random mutated creatures that take shape within these particular paths. For instance, in North America, aka our own US of A, there are these mind-dispensing barrels and attack turrets that have to be neutralized, 
and even those aforementioned mutated creatures deep beneath the Indian Ocean and extraterrestrial plants within the underground caverns of Asia, causing the crustal friction and volcanic eruptions, thereby summing up International Rescue's entire batch of operations. Well, that is until pursuing and infiltrating Hood's final station in outer space, inhabited by an endless plethora of defenses that rival both the Death Star and the fucking Forbidden Zone from Space Hunter, thereby also permanently bringing his schemes to an eternal fucking standstill. But, as is the case with every other fucking shmup out there, expect absolutely no remorse or grace periods from this shit. Cause apart from the ongoing onslaughts of Hood's platoons and natural and evolutionary disasters that'll throw your ass the Christ off, every operation in which you participate turns out to be both a race and fight against time, in and of themselves. And believe you me, your chances of prevailing in them are 650,000 kilometers up shit and piss creek, minus any robots or oars, unless your overall undeniable ass senses and expertise are on the up and up. At least the controls are responsive enough and way short of convoluted, given the customary don't blame the computer doctrine, especially when it involves avoiding any and all damage, be it environmental, natural, and or mechanical alike. And the less I say about the excruciatingly redundant yet nuts and bolts gameplay framework, the better. Challenge-wise, yet again, as typical of every shmup in history, Thunderbirds on Enios will rip off both your kidneys and your nuts, douse them in oil, and use them as sacrificial kindling to appease every historical and cultural deity. I'm looking at you two, especially Shiva and Ching Dai. In terms of evading the common types of damage, about which under no Mother Jesus damn fucking circumstances will I pressure myself to reiterate every now and again. Other than everything else, my only strong advice is watching out closely for everything. I mean, shit, you'll never know. There may be arbitrary rows and or columns of enemies that'll approach an assault without remorse, walls of dirt and or space station barricades to blast your goddamn way through, or those earlier recounted mutated lifeforms and or colossalist balls attack ships which, not surprisingly enough, may or may not take long to eradicate before proceeding depending on one's own tolerance level. Since there aren't any lives or continues whatsoever, refer to what I discussed about the 60-day stipulations, one of which passes should you succeed in each mission, and three of which are sacrificed every time a vehicle is ransacked to shit all, in which case, once again, Brains has to fucking repair it, but a game over will be declared should all 60 be wasted and or expired. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, there's even a three-turn number-based password system comprised of two to three digits, each depending on the individual number entered from zero, well, two zeros to be precise, through 255, totaling six to nine digits, on which I suggest writing down or looking up on the web should you decide to continue, aside from every fucking thing else. As dated and simplistic as the graphics are, they are far from an absolute eyesore, representing its source material in more ways than one could possibly imagine, or fathom at the very least. Most of the cutscenes are very reminiscent of the show, most notably when every main and supporting character advances every plot point in the form of status reports and updates, except when the hood's involved, laying one horseshit verbal barb at the International Rescue Brigade after another, and failing fucking miserably on top of it all. And even the sequences when all the Thunderbird vehicles are in motion not only during the intro, but also at the start of every mission. Regarding the varying stage areas, at least they're realistic enough depending on which continent and or void of space the Tracy Brothers launch ass through, in spite of how redundant they appear at times. Also, while Lady Penelope, voiced by the late Sylvia Anderson, one of the show's creators, I might add, was left out of this adaptation as anybody's guess. In terms of music and sound, orchestrated by Masaki Iwamoto, alongside Junichi and Hitoshi Saito, based on the show's original scores by the late Barry Gray, starting with the iconic opening march, and meshed with a handful of original tracks, every accompanying song possesses their convincing yet intense spark-filled vibes, with some ominous, albeit neutral, accents incorporated within. Granted, their sense of uniqueness may eventually die out faster than a failing car battery after a while, but, but at, least at least they're better than, than both Justin Bieber, Bieber and God forbid, forbid Nicky fucking, fucking Minaj combined any fucking day, day. and under no circumstances am I making any apologies, apologies for that whatsoever. whatsoever! And don't disappoint in the least, including the HQ briefing scenes, the continent selection map, 
Scott and Virgil's theme, Areas 1 and 2, in the US, the Indian Ocean, and Asia. Alan's theme for the US, Area 3, and Hood Space Station at the end. Gordon's theme for the Indian Ocean, Areas 3 and 4. Firefly's theme for Asia, Areas 3 and 4. And even the ending. As minimal and tedious as the sound effects are, they're at least appropriate and tolerable enough to fit the presentation, and are extremely short of inconsequential, considering what a blatant ass understatement I've arranged. Shit. Replayability-wise, at this juncture, there's pretty much fuck all else to deliberate on, as long as you're capable enough of looking past every commonly raved about flaw, over which I'm in no position to pinpoint, let alone reiterate, including but not limited to even the generic attack plane on the cover. Shit, false advertising much? And buckling down to every extreme, heinously searing mindfuck of a challenge that this game provides, in terms of all the common shmup tropes I always bring up. Not to mention take advantage of the fact that this was based on a popular 60s British-produced marionette series from the same folks responsible for Stingray, Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons, Firebird XL5, Joe 90, The Secret Service, what have us, which has undergone one revamp after another in recent decades for the record, and has since then been providing worldwide inspiration for other media involving marionettes. Once again, I'm looking at you, Aerial City 008, X-Bomber aka Starfleet, Interstar, and even the aforementioned Team America World Police, there's no reasonable as shit doubt in my mind that you'll be jetting back into Thunderbirds every now and then. Before I forget, there are other Thunderbirds games, some of which were out before and after, including but not limited to the Game Boy Advance adaptation of the infamous 2004 Universal and Working Title live-action film based on the show, with Kingsley as The Hood and the late Bill Paxton as Jeff Tracy, or the combined efforts of the also-defunct Vivendi Universal and Sapphire, A few Japan-only exclusives, including one on the Super Famicom by Cobra Team of Bastard fame. Another on Game Boy by the combined efforts of two other long since defunct companies, BI, that's B, hyphen, followed by an A and then an I, and Kid, short for Kindle Imagine Develop, of Barai Fighter, Loji Man, G.I. Joe and G.I. Joe the Atlantis Factor, Isolated Warrior, Kickmaster, Sumo Fighter, and Pepsi Man fame. and even a handful of European exclusives, which I won't get too damn deep into, considering its more massive popularity within the latter indicated starting territory as opposed to, uh, I don't know, everywhere else.
Henceforth, what's my final verdict? It should be an instant cinch by now to grasp why the late Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, may God rest both their souls, left such a lasting impact on pop culture for more than half a century, even leading up to their respective demises no less, and why many don't recommend and or fancy this particular adaptation much. Also, as much as I'm making every effort to avoid sounding like an absolute fucking dipshit by reiterating every goddamn detail I've laid out up until this point, I far, far beyond and low key suggest giving this NES rendition a jolt or two. Regardless of whether or not you're more than just a fan of International Rescue's never ending efforts, if you're also an all around die hard gung ho shmup addict like yours truly, and even 60 bit hero's own Ian Bergenton himself, in case he's watching and or listening to this, I wouldn't even dream of so much as fucking leaving this out in the frigid ass fucking cold. Whether loose or complete in box, it should run you approximately 16 to 265 bucks. As always, there should be no ounce of lament doing so whatsoever. Until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro Guy triumphantly signing off.